was a capitalist. That is, he was a man of Roman capitals. He was born, for example, in Tarsus, capital of Cilicia. Every time we find him, he seems to be in a capital of a Roman province, Antioch for Syria, probably Ancyra for Galatia, Ephesus for Asia, Thessalonica for Macedonia, Corinth for Achaia. He goes to the capitals, and that is his strategy. It's different from the strategy of Barnabas, which was to go one city to another along a Roman road and then backtrack. Paul goes to the capital. His idea is get the capital, get your Christian communities in the capital. They'll go out to other cities. The cities will go out to the villages. That's why you can make the astounding statement that after 20 years in the east, he's finished. He tells the Romans he's going west to Spain. In those cities, in the cities where Paul goes, we very often find them, for example, working with Priscilla and her husband Aquila, who are tent makers, workers in leather or in linen, especially for all those linen awnings that was needed all over the Roman Empire. And you wonder, say, if he's with, if he's with workers at Corinth, how does he ever get in contact with anyone who's slightly upper class? Well, the solution is, if you go to cities where Paul never went, say Pompeii, or Herculaneum in Italy, cities destroyed and then preserved in the lava of Vesuvius. You find something very, very interesting. If you look, for example, at the street frontage of a city like the House of the Bicentenary in Herculaneum, or the magnificent villa of the Fawn, probably the most magnificent villa in all of Pompeii, where you had that great mosaic of the Battle of Isis between Darius and Alexander. When you look at that street frontage, what you notice is shop, shop, high door into the villa, shop. Nobody wasted villa frontage on a main street without putting shops there. And when you look at those shops, some of them open directly into the villa. So for example, if Priscilla and Aquila and Paul had rented out a shop like that in an aristocratic villa in, say, Corinth, then they would have been clients, clients of the villa owner. And there'd be a contact, a certain contact between even the workers in those shops and the owners of the villa. This is the osmosis, as it were, between Paul as a worker and more aristocratic patrons, I think is the proper word, in places like Corinth.
when we're looking at the gate of Matthias and Mithridates, two imperial slaves who dedicated this beautiful gate to the emperor and the imperial family of Caesar Augustus. We're looking at something that Paul could have walked underneath. In fact, he almost certainly walked underneath. It was there by the beginning of the Christian era, and it's the main way in and out of the market down to the, the port. So Paul would have walked underneath this. If he turned and looked up, he would have found, for example, that above it it said, it's dedicated to Imperatori Caesari, to the Emperor Caesar, and right next, DVF, the Son of God, DV Filio, to the Son of God, abbreviated as DVF. Then you get his various other titles. He's Pontifice Maximo. He's the Supreme Pontiff. That's a religious term. A pontiff is somebody who pons fatere, who makes a bridge between heaven and earth. So the Supreme High Priest of Roman Imperial Theology is Caesar Augustus. I want to talk to you about the cities of the world of Paul, what life was like in the cities. The last several days, we've seen a number of cities of Asia Minor. And what we were able to see was basically the public monuments. The public monuments built at great expense by the wealthy and powerful, and they're gorgeous. They're gorgeous. What we have not seen is where ordinary people lived in these cities. And it's not simply because of the indifference of archaeologists who only want to go after the big things. It's because to a large extent, the dwelling places of ordinary people who are probably 80 to 90% of the population in cities have not survived. They weren't built for the ages, the way the public monuments and to some extent the homes of the wealthy and powerful were built. So I want to talk tonight about the 80 to 90% of the population of the cities who were not responsible for building those public monuments, except insofar as their labor made it possible. 